Well, welcome. Thank you for joining me today as we take up the first of a series of topics in 2021 that I think are especially important, uh, having to do with uh, emotional intelligence and elements in emotional intelligence and how um, those uh, factors play into our leadership and management uh, as we all have those different roles, as well as the kinds of things we might elevate in our coaching and facilitating um, with others. Now, uh, I, I just feel compelled to make sure that we always publicly acknowledge the hard work and unbelievable sacrifice that so many people in public services and essential roles are playing as we're all trying to manage and accommodate our COVID environment, um, it is nonetheless um, uh, the kind of uh, work that's essential. And maybe many of you have had uh, family members or close associates who've had to be uh, given special care as a result of COVID. And we know that the doctors uh, are saying to us and the healthcare folks are saying to us, um, you know, staying home, putting on your masks, uh, and doing those kinds of things to social distance enables folks to give the best care they can when it's necessary. And I might just pause to say we, in fact, at Talent Intelligent are engaged in some research. And if you, in fact, know of some healthcare providers who might be willing to do a very quick, uh, what we think of as digital card sort. Um, please let us know. You can drop us an email at info at talentintelligent.com or email me and we'll reach out to that physician or nurse or other healthcare provider to get some of their thoughts about what's important during our, our COVID um, uh, crisis, our pandemic that we're all trying to manage. Well, today's topic <clears throat> is one that I labeled trouble because the song, as those of you who came in a little early heard, um, the song says that, you know, there's trouble about, and that trouble can in fact lead to worry and lead to any number of uh, discomforts in relationships. And as we get into the day's topic, uh, there's a, there are a couple of pieces to it that I want to make sure um, that we lay the foundation for talking about conflict management and the kinds of things that will be important to us as we deal with conflict. For those of you who are new to me and me to you, um, you will find it, uh, I think, uh, important to know that I've been in this field for a very long time, and I have been very focused over the years on the kinds of things that in fact enable people to be more successful and fulfilled in the work uh, that they do. So each of the products or each of the services that I've been a part of have really been dedicated to A, what is good science about human behavior and how does that lead us to uh, making better choices? Now, in the work that Bob Eichinger and I have been doing, uh, we've been very focused on some particular kinds of behavior, some of which we'll talk about today uh, as we get into uh, this work. And um, I would even go so far as to say, if you have an iPad and you haven't downloaded Teamosity or Career Fitosity or Relate, which we've made available free, um, you should go pull it down because you'll find that it has some action-oriented tips to help people and boosting uh, and enhancing their relationships. So um, I am celebrating this year, the civil anniversary of I'm Not Crazy, I'm Just Not You. Uh, it's a book that has been um, uh, particularly popular for those people who know type and know the MBTI, uh, will find that the newest material could enrich your understanding. By participating in this series, uh, this one being the first um, of a series of EQ-related topics, I'm inviting you, if you would like, to send me an email with a shipping address, and I will send you, as a gift for participating in this uh, activity, um, 
some of my booklets, which are designed to enable people to be attuned to the role of emotions in their leadership and in their health and well-being. And in each booklet, there are some descriptions, which uh, you will hear a little bit about today, and some activities designed to help individuals uh, become a more manage, more of the self-manager of emotions that they uh, will find leads to fulfillment and stronger relationships. So in this series, which I've mentioned that I'll do this year, alternating every, every month I do a Pyramid Insight Hour. Uh, the first Insight Hour in 2021 was on restarting and retooling. Uh, this particular series I'm calling Economics because I happen to think that EQ has a financial um, outcome in uh, both our personal and our uh, business lives or organizational lives. And this year I am going to focus on these particular topics and you see the songs associated with them. And as you pay attention to the, the listings, you'll find, and as you read on our events page, uh, the details of what I'm going to be poking around in as we take a look at um, uh, these particular EQ-related issues. Now, in the next month's uh, topic, even though it's a talent, a very focused on talent, a talent issue, talent development issue, where we're looking at change leadership in, in a VUCA environment, the underscoring issue is trust and trustworthiness. And uh, as you think about that and think about how um, change in a VUCA world is impending upon you, you might want to check into that particular and register for that particular webinar. So today, uh, I want you to know that I have a couple of objectives in the time that we have. I want to talk about how it is that managing conflict and dealing with conflict is so essential. And you'll find that this theme comes through in a number of ways, no matter what level you're at in an organization or what help you're providing to folks in organizations. We'll find that consistently in research, uh, Conflict management and the effective dealing with conflict keeps bubbling up as amongst um, the most important topics and the kind of thing that uh, we are not particularly good at as a general rule. Um, there has been enormous data collected on how unresolved conflicts uh, can be enormously corrosive in organizations um, and how that corrosion can cost talent and cost work activity. Um, in one particular book by Harvard's um, professor, Bob Kagan, he, he mentioned in, in, in everybody culture, he mentioned the fact that a great deal of time is lost in productivity because people are spending more energy worried about uh, dealing with various relationships. And many of those uh, worries are driven uh, by poor conflict management within organizations. We'll take a look at what some research, especially the research from Meckard College, which has been looking at this for 30 years, um, how that research informs us today as we think about conflict management, management and of course, um, the underlying emotions that are involved in conflict. And I'm gonna ask you to uh, drop some comments in the chat space uh, as we get into our topic today. So thanks for being with us. Now, conflict management is so important in the work as Bob and I work through uh, libraries of research and we thought about the, the various, uh, what we think of as the kinds of roles that people are accountable for at whatever level they are in the organization it really came to us front and center that among the roles of leaders, those at the very top of organizations, conflict management is one of those roles which is a part of their job description. And their capacity to do that well uh, will in fact dictate uh, and impact the culture they create and dictate, dictate um, the, all the other kinds of leadership related dynamics that occur 
throughout an enterprise. We also have very specific practices in our CASAM which is managers and supervisors, and our Kasai library, which is individual contributors, the knowledge, skills, and attributes is the KSA piece of our modeling. And our, our cards really try to give a, a territory around the nature of conflict and the kinds of things that we're looking for at each level. There are different sorts of things when you are a manager and different sorts of things when you are an individual contributor. You know, organizations have all kinds of expectations about how people communicate and those uh, elements of culture impact how it is people behave. So I have a couple of funnies here intended to help elevate our mood a bit on a very heavy topic. Um, we hear the messaging around, you know, you need to be a very forceful communicator. And in this particular funny, uh, the manager's quite puzzled when she says, well, at least three times a day, someone leaves my office in tears. What do you mean I'm not a forceful communicator? It could be that some cultures or enterprises you deal with uh, consider that conflict is being managed well if nobody's talking. And so in this particular funny, we've got the notion of 40 days without an on-the-job conversation. So maybe conflict management is going along just rosy here, right? Um, sometimes people, when they talk about moments of conflict, talk about these sorts of jarring interactions which occur. Thanks, Brian, for your thoughtful and constructive proposal. Without further ado, let's dive into malicious indie-based criticism, character assassination, and petty bickering. Uh, we know there are cultures where um, this seems to be an inherent thread that runs through the culture, or people who feel that they're not being included or not being encouraged um, and uh, are being set up and not being treated fairly, which leads to discomfort and makes difficulties in managing conflict. Um, there is, of course, the blame culture. Uh, where it, uh, conflict is almost uh, uh, inherently a source of generating, well, somebody's at fault, uh, let's blame that particular person. Before we get into the real heart and center of conflict management, though, there's a little additional work we need to do, which I call um, getting behind the backstage. Um, there are a couple of things which are backstage elements that are vital for performance, I believe, whether it is um, looking at development. There's some backstage issues in development that as professionals, we should always be attuned to. And when it comes to EQ, I believe there's some backstage things we all need to have in the back of our mind as we think about emotional intelligence and the utilization of emotions, especially in conflict related circumstances. Now, when I think about staging, I, I'm really trying to say to us very intentionally, there's some mechanics about emotional intelligence we need to be attuned to. Um, it is true that uh, the kinds of expertise that we have is not accessible to everyone. Uh, there's some things that we know we keep as professionals um, because it's safe and, and a good thing to do. We know that uh, behind uh, backstage, there are controls, there are levers, there are props. There are a variety of things that, that are backstage that help us as we do our front stage work. And what we're going to do is take a little look at some of those backstage things. The big theme is this. Um, it's, it's quite striking that the more research that people do on the role of emotions and human well-being and human performance, this message keeps coming back at us. And that is no matter how much we try to come to the notion of conscious awareness and control, um, to do that and try to do it without paying attention to emotions is ultimately a faulty enterprise. It's foolhardy because as we are now learning more than ever, our emotional framework and our emotional makeup 
governs all things. Now, the whole field of emotional intelligence has taken a variety of turns over the last, especially last uh, 30 years in all seriousness. Um, I would say that the very first true scientific effort to look at emotions was actually Darwin's work, which has not been paid much attention to, where he wrote a piece called Expressions, the Expressions of Emotions in Animal and Human Life. And it was a book he published, uh, if I remember right, in 1874, in which he systematically went through with enormous detail and identified how emotions are expressed and how they serve the organism. It was it's a quite interesting piece. If you've never uh, uh, attempted to pull out and take a look at uh, Darwin's works, this particular one, I believe, is incredibly accessible. And here we are 120 years, 150 years later, um, realizing that a lot of what he described about emotions, in fact, have, uh, as we think of it, biological and neurological components. Uh, which are quite uh, understandable, um, though not always uh, clear cut as to what's prompting a particular emotional response. So as I've thought about it and I've read uh, as much as I can, can possibly consume on the research in emotional intelligence, the neurological, biological, physiological, psychological elements of emotional intelligence, it seems to me that there are four big circles that cover the territory. And if there was any message that you walk away from emotional intelligence today, I really wish it would be this image that, in fact, at the very heart of all models of emotional intelligence is the matter of emotional literacy. And we'll say more about that in just a second. I believe that the field, the science of emotional intelligence, has settled on the framework by Mayor Salovey and Caruso that there are eight capabilities that have to do with self-management and management of our interactions with others that pretty much cover the territory of emotional intelligence. They have, as um, you, some of you may know, the only true power test, um, like an IQ test is a power test, uh, to measure emotional intelligence, and they suffer the same challenges as IQ tests do in the measurement of this particular arena, uh, emotional intelligence. There are legions of researchers in personality who will tell you, you don't need to know anything about emotional literacy or anything about the capabilities of emotional intelligence. Just understand the mechanisms of personality and how personality is played into the management of emotions and the management of relationships, and you have all you need to know. That, as you might imagine, is a much debated proposition what we do know for sure, though, when we take a look at the entire territory, is that there are a series of behaviors that are, regardless of the model, regardless of the framework you use, there are a series of behaviors that are absolutely um, a, a core part of the nature of emotional intelligence and how, in fact, it is uh, delivered as one goes through their daily life. Now. There are some rules that are always true about emotion. So if we take a look at all these people who've studied emotions and emotional intelligence, we know that we generate our emotions. In other words, nobody generates those emotions for us. People do things. We see those things or hear those things, and those things may prompt in us certain emotional reactions, but that's the first that's the first step of emotional intelligence. I'm having emotions. What are those emotions about? What is my system? What is my psychological system suggesting to me about my mind maps and the way in which I'm viewing and interpreting something that's happening around me? Likewise, we know at the end of the day, emotions drive behavior. 
emotions, the whole word emote is about the motivation, the energy for behavior. Now, emotional literacy is about being able to define emotions. And there are a couple of ways we can come at this. And unfortunately, we're not going to be able to spend much time here. But just know that there, uh, when we think about emotional literacy, and there now, in the last 10 years especially, since we are able to put special caps on people's heads and let them walk around during the day and uh, we can record how their brain activity works, we know that people who can identify their emotions more precisely uh, moderate those emotions more effectively. So the, the increasing awareness of the nature of the emotions that we have and labeling those emotions and putting those emotions in their place is a part of what emotional literacy is all about. We can come to it in a whole variety of sources if you go looking for what, what do various people say, the meaning of, for example, an emotion like surprise is, or an emotion like fear, what's the, what, is, what is it that our psychological system is trying to tell us uh, by virtue of this initial language our psychology has? I'm, I'm making really the statement that emotions are a language within our own psychology, and we have to sometimes learn to listen to that language with more precision and, and acutely be aware that uh, if I'm having angry reactions because I feel like there's been a violation of me in some way or a violation of agreement or I'm being perceived in a way that I believe is unfair, Chances are when other people are angry, they're having the same feeling. They're having the same, uh, they're, they're being gripped by the same psychological energy of feeling that uh, they have uh, been prevented from achieving something or some violation has occurred that they feel um, needs to be uh, taken care of in some way. So there are a variety of ways. In fact, uh, I could give you a list of some very practical resources, and if you're interested, you can let me know of how we can learn to be more attentive. If you go on the web and look up the emotions wheel, you'll see in the public information space a variety of ways of thinking about emotions. I've done things like this in facilitated programs. I've taken this particular image and made a handout of it, or I've given a list of positive and negative emotions and just put it out on the table. And as we've gone through our leadership training activities, the one thing or the other, and I, I will do a debrief and ask people how they feel about it. And they'll look at me oddly sometimes. And I'll say, well, use the, the prompters in the middle of the table. You can see that there's a different way we can label our emotions and how we feel about what we've just been through or what we've just experienced. And I cannot tell you over the years the number of executives who've said to me, you know, that page on naming emotions may be one of the most valuable pieces I've walked away with in this whole experience. I didn't realize, and now that I do realize that my emotions are more nuanced, um, I have a greater appreciation for the power of emotions and the role that it plays uh, in my life. I mentioned Mayor Salovey and Caruso. Uh, for those of you who do research on them or want to look up their work, just know um, that the four abilities that they identify and that they've created a, a, a very powerful test to, in fact, verify, uh, you see listed on the screen. And I'm not going to go into detail on those except to say um, that some fairly um, well-established, um, very well-known researchers have come around to the point of view of Mayor Salovey and Caruso and said, you know, I think they really are on to something about the nature of what emotional intelligence is and how, in fact, emotional intelligence plays out in human experience. Now, I've gone to those eight abilities and organized them around perceiving and judging. Um, you see them listed, uh, the first four on the screen, and I've attempted to give you some everyday examples 
know that as you look at this, it won't surprise you if you know psychological type that these are perfect parallels to uh, the very functions that Jung said uh, that are networked into our brain and running around in our brain around how we perceive things and similarly on how we judge things. I brought this up to, to Mayer and Salavan Caruso in several conversations and they uh, allowed as to, gosh, maybe what they were tapping into certainly was parallel to the propositions Jung was providing that there are some things about our psychology um, which have some predictable networks and resources that we can become aware of and use in more uh, effective ways. So we know personality magnifies our emotions and our emotional expressions. We know that personality is very much an influencer of how we engage and interact with others. And learning how to utilize our personality to make our personality, our ally, uh, requires a level of awareness that um, certainly exceeds what we want to touch into today. But just as a prompter, that when it comes to managing our emotions, being attentive to our personality is really very important. When you blend it all together, um, what we know is that personality is that EQ. It's really about a set of skills that help us recognize our impulses and moods, our emotional energies, read situations from others more accurately and respond in ways that produce a more constructive outcome. Now, that is precisely what a good manager of conflict has in mind. What are the ways that I need to recognize the elements in this conflict what are the kinds of things that I'm reading in the way the individuals involved are responding? And how can I help facilitate the movement in a way that's more productive? So it could well be that, yeah, empathy is a part of the answer um, and a piece of the uh, equation. And I happen to believe it's a large part of the equation. Uh, we can't allow ourselves to get caught in a situation where we feel like there has to be a consensus answer. Uh, there needs to be a, a productive answer. Sometimes a consensus answer is not it. We most definitely, in dealing with conflict, want to make sure that there's uh, no one involved in the situation who's excluded from working through uh, the solution as we move forward. So. I'm curious, as you think about your own growth uh, around emotional intelligence, what would you say is the particular part of emotional intelligence that you have been, as, as a professional, that you've been trying to tune up and polish and work on um, that you believe would enable you to be more effective in the work that you do. So if you would, um, make sure that uh, you just drop in the, in the um, chat spot what some of your thoughts are about the kinds of elements of emotional intelligence that you are working on. So, for example, I find that um, uh, as the COVID environment has facilitated and elevated levels of stress in a variety of ways that I'm learning to be more, uh, if you will, um, giving my emotions uh, uh, more of a seat at the table to find out what they're about. And it, as much as I know about it, it's I'm finding it very interesting under this COVID set of conditions, the kinds of emotions that I'm having and having to get in dialogue with those emotions in new and different ways is an interesting challenge. So for you, what are you saying? Tempering sarcasm is one observation. Reading others comes naturally. Yeah, working on the messages that we send is certainly an important part of it. Less rushing to solution. Those are interesting thoughts. Yeah, thank you for 
and continue to share, if you will, patience. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, with being patient with ourselves, um, I think is very important. And we're not so patient with ourselves. It strikes me. I've watched it in, in, in all kinds of folks who uh, we're extremely patient with other people but may not be so patient or forgiving with ourselves, which we need to do. Now, finding alternatives to hugs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is its own challenge, isn't it? Well, as I've suggested to you, and I will throughout this series, as we deal with different elements of EQ related uh, challenges, um, and how those show up in our work uh, with others. I do believe uh, enhancing our EQ skills and being attuned to our EQ uh, dimensions and facilitating that awareness with others is really very important if we want to enable others and ourselves to be good conflict managers. I contend that effective conflict management skills are very much nestled in our overall EQ frame and our EQ perspective. So it, it, as leaders, coaches, managers, um, we know that sometimes we're called upon to referee in a conflict. And I would suggest that that's, that's a beginning spot if we're being involved in helping others or ourselves being involved in conflict with others. So we have to ask, well, what is it that we might be refereeing? If you look up definitions of conflict, we get several interesting frames, a serious disagreement. Notice, not just a disagreement, but a serious disagreement. Now, I've been asking people over the years, and there are plenty of people who will say, well, it doesn't have to be serious. A disagreement is a conflict in their mind. Um, there's certain issues of compatibility around your know, own internal conflicts, having certain things we want to do but not sure we should do, have an internal conflict, an incompatibility with um, working with another individual or individuals, or being an active disagreement. These are the typical definitions with conflict, and they're somewhat helpful, but not as helpful as being attuned to the research, and mostly this comes out of Eckerd College's work over the years in looking at conflict, um, you will see that, that also folks who've been looking at issues of influence and in research um, have done a, a nice job of helping us get a handle on. And I, I have my judgment, you might disagree and that's fine, um, that in fact, the easiest of conflicts to address are conflicts that have difference of perspectives and facts. Um, those we can establish some boundaries and rules and agree to that enable us to sort through the perspectives and facts, which make it easier to manage than the next, which is strategies and tactics. And it's more difficult because strategies and tactics are more conceptual and tap into more threaded beliefs about the nature of things and what's going uh, on in the world based on the facts that have been decided or looked at. The most difficult of all conflicts are conflicts of values and ideals. Years ago, I did some training with um, some of the elite military teams and in their training room i'll never forget it over the door there was a big sign that said um, when values collide people divide and so i asked the the head of this particular elite unit about that and what uh, he believed it was a he uh, believed uh, the intended message for everyone who came into that training room. And he said, we all must be committed to, of course, very patriotic values in that particular group. There is no room for variation, he said. 
on these values and ideals for what it is that drives what we do. And if you cannot embrace those, you do not belong here. Values and ideals are so deeply embedded in the psyche for many, many people that the amount of emotional energy that gets generated when these are uh, being bumped up against, um, it's, it's really very difficult for people to uh, manage those emotions in more productive ways. So when we think about conflict, we first need to really get a handle on well, what is the primary source of the conflict and what is that source and what is, what is it, the amount of energy I may have to be putting into this process to enable us to more effectively deal with conflict and move on. Now, difference of, uh, uh, differences in facts can be resolved by agreeing on what source of data we're gonna rely on. And here we have a picture of the Great Salt Lake taken in 1973 from the exact same angle taken in 2006 um, and we see what's happened uh, to the Great Salt Lake during that time. This is a satellite image that was made at two different times. So the facts really aren't in question. Uh, what we may find in question though is the interpretation of the facts. We know that in conversations you can begin to hear the tweaking of discomfort when people say, like in this dialogue, two different people talking about what they believe to be our sufficient facts, you begin to see that the, the heat is going to emerge in this interaction where there's a difference of opinion, but you can feel that various things are being put out there that will enable us to pay attention to, well, how we might get out of this disagreement, like additional data or additional sources, as we work on uh, finding common ground around the facts that we're trying to work through. Sometimes um, the facts lead us to odd and curious places, such as our examples here. Uh, it looks good on paper, but gosh, something happened when we implemented it. Sometimes information is so ambiguous that the ambiguity itself is the source of the conflict. And coming to recognize that and talk about that and understand the role of the ambiguity is a, a big deal. Sometimes the map we have in our head about information is off. And it takes conversation and additional information for um, the facts to be put in their place or the context to be put in their place. So every map of the world that you take a look at represents the world exactly as you see it. And it's a lie. It's a lie when it comes to Africa. Africa as a continent is so huge that in fact, the United States, China, India, Europe, the United Kingdom, a good deal of the rest of the world can fit on the African continent. But for years, all of us went to school seeing a particular map and we've operated as though that map was in fact the way the world is. And only when there is new data, new perspectives, do we begin to see that there is a different reality to the information. Now, strategy sometimes may not be clear. In this particular conversation, we can begin to hear an individual say, well, look, there are four strategies and we need to prioritize those. And another person comes along and says, well, I think we need to rethink those. Uh-oh, we now probably are gonna have trouble. The first person says, well, look, we went through a lot of data. We went through all the recommendations. We've came to these strategic uh, perspectives from different analytical groups. We could argue about these for months. The time to decide is now. So now we have a new element that's in, in, in been introduced into this disagreement and this disappointment. And the other person says, well, I've been looking at competitive data and I think we're going in the wrong directions. So we're no longer talking about the argument of facts. We're now arguing 
about what to do with those facts, what to do and how to put those together to make a reasonable strategy in our enterprise, and sorting through this and getting to an understanding and a common ground perspective uh, is difficult, but nowhere near as difficult as an affront of values. When we get to values where people are beginning to say, well, look, if we do what you're suggesting, you are gonna diminish the value of what we bring to the table. You're gonna diminish the highest ideals of this enterprise. Once we are in that space, or you're going to offend my values, my sense of uh, what's important, and my sense of what makes meaning, um, we, we are getting to a place where now we feel we're not hearing each other. Well, fortunately, the research tells us that if we look at people's behaviors, we can begin to group those behaviors in dealing with all of these conflicts into four general groups. And Eckerd College has been publishing this now and reaffirming this for years, that when we take a look at the strategies that people use in dealing with conflict, the ones that are constructive and active are perspective taking, creating solutions, expressing emotions, and reaching out. Now, expressing emotions doesn't mean having a temper tantrum. It means that we're able to say, let me tell you, I'm feeling a bit uh, uncomfortable with how this discussion is unfolding. And I'd like to take a time out to rethink a little bit before we come back and have more discussion. Or I can tell that this is pretty agitating to you and frustrating. And I know it's sometimes difficult to problem solve when you're feeling pretty frustrated. So maybe taking a time out right now would be a good thing to do. So the notion of expressing emotions is about how we identify the emotion and put it out there. And, and then as a result of doing that, um, asking for something as a, as a way of being aware. We've all seen the destructive, um, active and passive uh, ways in which people deal with conflict. Um, perhaps the most common are, are those people who try to win at all costs. They don't care who they leave ground in the dust. Um, there are those who think anger is going to be the winner of the day. Um, throwing temper tantrums uh, seems to be a, a strategy that some employ uh, because they, they, they are aware that people don't like to be around angry people and they think they'll get their way that way. And perhaps the other one that's more uh, subterfuge is reta retaliation that might occur in an enterprise. So our goal is to, how do we begin to be more intentional about using the more constructive strategies and how do we help other people? How do we model that and how do we help them as we think about uh, uh, helping them manage conflict in productive ways? When I look at the things that they found in their research, to me, it follows very much along the lines of what emotional intelligence research tell us. And that is, by changing perspectives and opening ourselves to multiple perspectives, we actually change the emotional equation. That when we allow ourselves to neutralize negative emotions, we can move toward more creative solutions. The most amazing thing about naming emotions is that it enables the emotion to have its space, but not power over your psychological place. And the same thing regarding uh, reaching out, that when we reach out to others, uh, we are building a bridge to move toward a more constructive place. So we know those are important strategies and tactics, and we want to keep them on the forefront. We know that being reflective sometimes is necessary, and it's a constructive thing to do. To say, look, I need to. I need some time to think about this before we act, um, and sometimes to decide that, gosh, you know, I can adapt to this. This is okay. I can integrate to this now that I understand what the other person or persons is trying to do. We know that these are no. These particular tactics will not lead to good outcomes. 
Um, they are passive and they will bite in very uh, negative ways when they play out. So we think of these particular strategies in context to what are the typical pathways that occur in conflict. There are conditions which set it up. There's an onset. Typically something has happened. There's been something that's initialized emotional energy or an emotional reaction um, that leads to an event of some form, uh, which after the event, there's reflections on or talking about uh, what transpired. And then always in conflict, there are residuals. And as uh, leaders, coaches, managers of others, being mindful of the residuals and using that energy productively is really important. So I'm curious in the chat box, if you will, what are a couple of the things that are your hot buttons during conflict? What is it that when it happens, you know that you're getting hot under the collar around a situation that you're anticipating as being conflictual, uh, or maybe it even surprised you as a, a conflict? What struck you and what's a hot button? Um, that occurs for you, not being heard, being interrupted, a person not willing to accept additional information <clears throat> uh, is a hot button. The derogatory approaches or jumping to conclusions <clears throat> is a hot button. Yeah, those are interesting. What about this question? When you are experiencing a conflict situation, what are the emotions that bubble up for you? What tends to be the emotional energy that shows up? <clears throat> Frustration, <clears throat> several frustrations. Don't wanna play anymore. <clears throat> Surge of physical energy, a flight response, impatience. Yeah, I always experience it emotionally in my gut. Uh, I have this hit inside that says, okay, it looks like we're headed to a conflict. I need to manage my discomfort. I feel a great deal of discomfort because I don't want damage to the relationship. And yet I know we have to work through it. And so there's this sense of this enormous discomfort in emotional dread uh, that occurs for me when I'm dealing with conflict. What about what you see in others? Is it similar or different? Do you see that folks, when they're in conflict, maybe with you, what are the kind of emotions that you see they express? Is it similar? Anger? Major anger? Uh, yeah. Now, there are some tactics, thank you for sharing, that we can employ to help us neutralize emotions. And these are useful, whether it's conflict or some other circumstance. And I'm only tapping into a couple of them, but they're the ones that have the biggest impact. For example, being a generous listener where we paraphrase not only content, but the emotional reality that's in front of us in the circumstance. There is it's an incredible data about the power of paraphrase and what it does to moderate the emotional condition of another person. Open-ended questions invite meaning creation and in conflict especially, um, it's enormously important to do if we're wanting to get to solution. And then of course, solution focused questions are extraordinarily powerful at all times where emotions are involved, but especially in conflict-related situations. The three solution-focused questions that I find are the most useful of when I say to an individual, gosh, if you had a magic wand and you waved it and something changed, what would change? How, how would this situation change and be improved? Now, sometimes I say to folks on a scale of one to 10, uh, a 10 being the most annoyed, frustrated, angry you've been, how are you in this situation? And when they say, well, I'm a seven, I'll then ask, well, what's something we can do to drop that a notch or two? Uh, the other one 
if you could rewrite this situation, what would be the narrative? Now, what's interesting about these questions is that, especially with the rating question, the moment a person puts a weight on an, an emotion, that emotion is contained. And we actually have seen uh, through various researchers who've done this sort of thing that the blood flow changes on the cortex when people are asked these kinds of questions. The blood flow that's um, actually being prompted much by the amygdala and stimulating those emotional hormonal centers of the brain shifts when uh, we ask these questions and it changes to more executive functions of the brain by, by neutralizing the emotional climate inside the, the, the person's head. Now, as I mentioned when we started, conflict management is threaded through all of our libraries. Uh, I happen to believe that emotional intelligence and finding emotionally intelligent choices um, is as well. So when we think about it, we know for those of you who aren't aware of our libraries, the knowledge, skills, and attributes of individual contributors or managers or leaders have different uh, roles within each, different uh, practices within each, and they are down to from the practices particular behaviors. And to show you how important conflict management is, I went through all the practices in the libraries to pay attention to how does conflict management impact an individual wherever she or he is inside of an enterprise? And on a vast majority of our practices at some level, how we're managing conflict could have an impact on how effective we are in a variety of uh, the practices that we uh, are trying to execute to be effective in the roles that we're in. Um, as I mentioned, from uh, the top being a key role for leaders all the way down to individual contributors, we know that learning to manage conflict in productive, constructive ways can impact all kinds of elements of overall performance. <clears throat> and as I said, in our materials, uh, we give uh, what we think of as organizationally appropriate guidance for the kinds of things that are important for dealing with conflict wherever you happen to be in the enterprise. Now, <clears throat> there is a great stretch between bridging the gap of knowing and doing. This one hour review of taking a look at emotional intelligence and this exploration of some things we know and have found around conflict management gives you a taste of and a framing for uh, the kinds of things you might do. But there's an entire piece that we don't have time to talk about today about going from the knowing to the doing. And I just want to encourage you to be mindful that we know it takes time to make adjustments. We know it requires reinforcement to make the changes. We know that we need to create environments for us to be stimulated to do something different. Uh, when it comes to something that's emotionally charged like conflict management. And we also know that feedback is vital if we in fact are going to have the kind of change uh, that we wanna make. This much I know is true, that our vitality toward any goal is as great as our intentionality. Paul Tillich said that 50 years ago, it was true then, it's true today that we will not make any change, we will not move toward actualizing any of that knowledge unless we invest energy and we put our energy to the test of our intentions uh, for getting where we would like to be. I know all of you know that you can reach us on the website. You also know we have a, a LinkedIn page. I'm happy to have you connect with us on that page to share and react to different ideas.